Welcome to The World Today, a Christian perspective, with our host, Chuck Smith from Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and our special guests, noted author and speaker, Hal Lindsey, and defense specialist, Chuck Missler. Today, people are wondering just what 1993 is going to bring as far as the world economy is concerned, because at that time, this great economic power will be developed in Europe that has the potential of overshadowing the whole world. It is interesting that the Bible has quite a bit to say about this new power and government that is arising in Europe. And we would like to talk about what's happening in our world today and what the Bible has to say about these things. Today we are glad to have with us in this discussion, Chuck Missler and Hal Lindsey. Chuck, why don't you give us a little bit of a biblical background from Daniel on the European community? Well, Daniel, of course, is one of the most interesting books of the Bible, especially to us Gentiles, because whereas the Bible in general focuses on world history in terms of its impact on Israel, there are two interesting exceptions to that. In Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, where God gives us an overview of all Gentile history. In Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar has his famous strange dream that Daniel interprets for him and for us, which lays out the history of the sequence of world empires from that day unto the present. And, and of course, course the, the, and we, we see in that, that image a, a metallic image made of four different metals, metals actually five different, different materials. materials. Gold, gold, silver, brass, brass and, and then iron, and then iron mixed, mixed with clay. And, and those, of course, are described as the, the sequence of empires. The Babylonian Empire, which was conquered by the Greeks, uh, by the Persians, and then the Persians conquered by the Greeks, and then the Greeks by the Romans. And the Roman Empire doesn't get conquered, it breaks into pieces. But we see in the imagery of Daniel 2 that these pieces come back together into a final form sort of a second phase of the fourth empire or a fifth empire, if you will. But what's interesting is the idiom of the fifth is the same almost as the fourth, namely iron and then iron mixed with clay. And clay, of course, refers to people all through the scripture. You are the potter, I am the clay, as the expression goes. So we see, the, that's why scholars who have studied Daniel see a revived Roman empire as an idiom for a final, a final phase. Later in Daniel's life, in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel is given a vision directly by God, and we see the same information but presented not from man's viewpoint, as Nebuchadnezzar's was, but from God's viewpoint, where these same empires are not seen as shiny metals, but rather as a series of voracious beasts. And again, we have the Babylonians conquered by the Persians, or the Medo-Persians, then conquered by the Greeks, and then the, conquered by the Romans. But again, this fourth empire goes into two phases. It comes back in a sort of revised, terrible, awesome form. And as we study the idioms of Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, we find them picked up in the book of Revelation, all speaking of a final world empire that uh, endures right until the time when Jesus Christ returns and sets up his empire to substitute of this. And what makes Daniel so provocative to us is that this is laid out so clearly, and it's happening today. The interesting thing to me is that um, with the ten horns of Daniel's vision, they come out of the beast, that fourth beast. Uh, with the iron and iron and clay, it would surely indicate that uh, this fifth kingdom or the second part of the fourth is definitely related to the Roman Empire. You know, I like the precision, uh, Chuck, that it talks about this in uh, Daniel chapter 7. If I can locate it here quickly. Uh, it, it simply says, 
uh, as it talks about the fourth kingdom and how it would conquer and devour the whole earth. And it says in verse 24, as for the ten horns, out of this kingdom, mm -hmm. ten kings will come. You know, I, I talk with a lot of people about prophecy, and they say, well, it has to be coextensive with the whole geographical limits mm -hmm. of what was once Rome, but it doesn't say that. It no. simply says, out of that. So uh, the ten nations should emerge out of the people and culture, I suppose, of that, but not necessarily the same exact geographical locations. And I think the other thing, Hal, is that in Daniel 9, mm -hmm. where we have the title of this coming world leader, the prince that shall come, it says that the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Well, we know that the people that destroyed the city and the sanctuary, sanctuary were Romans, Romans, or say Western Europeans to broaden it a little. Uh, it's interesting, there again we have this reflection that, this, that in the end times, the final super leader, will be in some sense a European or Roman in, in the broad sense of the term. And as it says, and as it expands into Revelation 17, it, it definitely says that he will rule out of the city of Rome. The seven heads yes, sir. are the seven hills. Exactly. All, definitely. Uh, actually, the eleventh horn uh, rises up, it would seem, out of the same beast mm -hmm. Uh, that then conquers three of the kings uh, to establish his position. But a little bit about the history of the European community because it's gone through several names. For a long time we called it the common market. And then it was the European economic community. And now to me it is significant that they've sort of dropped the economic and just call it the European community. But the Club of Rome, go ahead and give us a little insight on that, Chuck, from which the well, whole thing was born. The whole thing is born after the Second World War and the recognition that we could never let that happen again. And so several attempts to uh, establish mutual defense pacts failed. But a, a few visionaries saw the idea that before Europe could unite, they needed to unite its economies. And so the Treaty of Paris in 1951 formed an entity called the European Coal and Steel Community. And that would bore you to death unless you're in economics. But it turned out that multinational organization was very successful and became the model of, of a subsequent treaty. And on March 25th of 1958, they formed a treaty, uh, actually signed two treaties, both called the Treaty of Rome. They, were, they met in Rome, and six nations got together and formed the European uh, Economic Community, which had three phases laid out, and also the European Atomic Energy Community. So now there were three organizations, the European Coal and Steel Community, the European Economic Community, and the European uh, Atomic Energy Community. In uh, 1967, they all merged into one properly called the European Community. Our press in this country kept the label common market, which emerges from one of those three entities. Mm -hmm. But it's a misnomer. From about 1970, 73 on, these things coalesced. They have a constitution called the Treaty of Rome that's empowering. Both Italy and France tried to withdraw and discovered there are no withdrawal provisions. Mm. And so it was a powering document. That's why when they had the vote in Britain to join, mm -hmm. the people uh, that were adverse to that argued that they will not let the crown of England be subject to a continental confederation. And of course they lost, because that's what they've gone ahead and done in the meantime. But we have an international court of justice. We have a legislature called the European Parliament. And we have an executive branch called the European Community uh, Commission commissions in Brussels, once in Strasbourg, once in Luxembourg, but we have a model that's analogous to the United States. We have a constitution called the Treaty of Rome, we've got a legislature, They're part, they have a European Parliament, and of course they have the executive branch called the Commission. But they are now coalesced, and what we now discover is that coal and six other of the 12 ministers have agreed to pursue the yielding of full sovereignty to a centralized government in Europe. And so as we stand back and watch, uh, it's very exciting. And of course, many of us made mistakes because there's 12 primary nations. We get confused because as you pointed out, Chuck, the 10 the Bible talks about comes out of the result. They don't, it yeah, isn't 10 coming the together. for me, you're right. You know, I find it fascinating, fascinating that, that uh, uh, Mrs. Thatcher really, really fell over the issue of, of yielding the sovereignty of England to this uh, continental confederation. But, but it, it you, you know, know, the thing, thing is, we look at history today, and uh, I can remember, for instance, when I first started studying prophecy 36 years ago, um, people said you were crazy.
crazy to think that there would ever be a United States of Europe. Yes, maybe they'll cooperate uh, with a few uh, economic ventures, but they'll never be a United States of Europe. And as a matter of fact, uh, as recently as uh, 1978, there was a man who wrote a book called Me a False Prophet. And his primary reason for that was uh, my saying there would be a United States of Europe. And he said it will never happen. This man, by the way, was uh, in some ways connected with the Vatican. You mean people were taking shots at you, Hal? Oh, I've never yeah. heard of him. <laughs> I don't know why, but <laughs> Chuck, I've known Hal for 20 years, and he's never happy unless they are. <laughs> I fear I'm not being effective. A stink bomb here or there. <laughs> But you know, it, it, as you look at this, it's really amazing. The United States probably reached the apex of its uh, world power asserting itself uh, since World War II in the recent Gulf conflict. And yet, from the beginning of my understanding of the Scripture, I have always said that the United States will not lead the West. Uh, the Scripture doesn't specifically even infer that. But it is very definite. In fact, so much of end-day in prophecy is devoted to talking about this Western alliance that comes out of the ruins of the Roman culture. And so therefore, in the light of what we see today, it's going to be interesting to see how this change takes place, in a sense, the changing of the guard, because the West must be led by this uh, revived Roman Empire. What are the economic uh, potentials of this joining of these European nations? I think it's flabbergasting. See, I'm a Naval Academy graduate, and I remember being briefed on our strategic decisions that we faced during the Second World War, where we faced Japan and the Pacific and Europe uh, on the other end. And when you look at the numbers and the economics and the industrial base, you discover a, what's called the heartland concept. Mm -hmm. He who, dis who controls the heartland of Europe would control the planet. And so we knew we had to neutralize Hitler before p putting significant resources in the Pacific. From that background, it fascinates me to see, once again, a, a union controlling what's called the heartland. Now, the United States is about 280 million people. Europe, united, is about 750 million population. Mm -hmm. They have an economy that's potentially two, three times the United States, if they can get their act together. But I'm fascinated with what Dan the precision and insight yes, of Daniel, exactly. because we have the iron of the Roman Empire, but in the final phase, it's iron mixed with clay. And no matter how hard Europe tries to coalesce, it'll never regain Those the strength. Cultures. Mm -hmm. They yeah, have it's had like the clay. Yeah, they had millennial yeah. of millennia of conflict, the different languages. So they'll unite and be a formidable force, but never with the strength. But you look, you just look at economically. We talked about this before. And that is, if we were to take General Motors, Chrysler Motors, Ford Motors, and merge them all together, the power they would have would be much more than the sum of what they are now. Mm -hmm. In other words, it would be a multiplication factor, right. not an addition factor. Mm -hmm. And just think, with the power and the technical ability they have in Europe now, what it would be when they're no longer fighting each other, but working together. Well, in the corporate scene, which you mentioned, you using it as an analogy, but let's go one step further. I was with Mr. Henry Ford and R.G. Miller when they formed the mm -hmm. Ford of Europe strategy back in 67. They saw the vision, and their perception was that the econo economy of the planet Earth will be controlled from Europe within 30 years, and their long-term strategy mm -hmm. was to put their base there. When I left Ford in 68, over half their assets were in Europe. Mm -hmm. Now, um, IBM Corporation is no longer a U.S. corporation. It's a, multi it's a true multinational corporation. The shrewd corporate strategists are straddling borders and putting their nest egg in Europe because they've recognized that Europe's claim is they have not created a common market for foreigners. Mm. And guess who the foreigners are? Mm. Us. Yeah. And so the, the shrewd corporate strategists, even from the secular world, are beginning to recognize that the name of the game is to get in under the wall before it gets closed. Of course, as far as the future is concerned, from a biblical standpoint, um, where does that put us in the whole end time scenario? Well, I believe that when you look at the whole scenario and how rapidly it's coming together, that the, the last big chunk of this thing that had to be fulfilled is in Europe. I believe that... Uh, we will see very shortly, 
1992, we'll see the United States of Europe. But very shortly after that, they'll, they'll be recognized the need for a leader who can really put this thing together. And so when we talk about a revived Roman Empire from a biblical point of view, almost part and parcel with that, we're talking about a great leader that the Bible predicts will come along with that. And it's coming at just a time when uh, it is so necessary to have that leader to settle the Middle East problem. That's heating to a boiling point. So I believe what we're going to see very shortly is not only uh, the world waking up in 1993 to the fact an awesome power has been created, but also to the fact that uh, a leader will emerge there. He will somehow, out of the midst of that, bring together ten powerhouse states, perhaps as the rulers of other states there, and that from that power base he's going to, uh, he's going to settle the Arab-Israeli conflict. So you see this actually as a potential for a world dominating kind right. of a power. Yes, once he makes that, one, once he ascends to that power base, according to the scripture, he will rapidly consolidate all other nations under his leadership, and probably because of the economic benefits at first, and the ability to bring about a stable world, much like what we hear today with this new world order. I mean, you know, and now the United States is sort of the the key role in this new world order. But the concept they're talking about is much what I've seen in the scripture. This man of sin, son of perdition, beast, and the various and assorted names that have been given to him uh, comes with the powers of Satan. Satan gives to him his throne and uh, his, his, his authority. authority. In, in Revelation, Revelation chapter 13. 13. So, do you see any tie between uh, the rise of Satanism uh, in the world today? And, and it seems that uh, Europe is ahead of us in, in some of these realms of the witchcraft and so forth, England and all. They certainly are, Chuck. And you know, this, this, this is key. For instance, from the Renaissance to about the mid-1960s, we live in a world where the, the academic community especially and, and the rest of the world about them, uh, they were rationalistic. In other words, they looked at everything empirically. If they couldn't see it, hear it, touch it, taste it, smell it, or prove it by the so-called uh, scientific process, they said it wasn't real. And then there was this incredible change that took place on the campus. Uh, first the campuses, as I saw it, where they started going toward a belief in the occult. Yes. And uh, that's why I wrote so many years ago, Satan is alive and well on planet Earth, because what the scripture predicts is Satan does not want a rationalistic world. He wants a religious world, a world that has seen supernatural phenomena based upon the, the following of the occult. And I really believe the world is set up for it now as never before in history, and that had to take place. Do you think that there's any tie between that uh, sort of renaissance of the of the, the occultish kind of things with uh, the drug use? Because uh, I know that many people were sort of uh, made aware of a another world through the psychedelic drugs. Yeah, you went through all of that. You saw it firsthand. We saw it firsthand. <laughs> you really did, especially here at Carver Chapel. Yes, I really do believe. Uh, the interesting thing is in Galatians 5, where it talks about the, the uh, various sins of the flesh, uses the word pharmakia, the Greek word from which we get the word pharmacy, and yet it's translated sorcery. Sorceries. And then another place in the scripture is translated witchcraft. Right. So and and that's, that is apparently because uh, drugs and, and demonic activity was always associated together in the Bible, and there really is an association that's not not uh, largely recognized today. But you know, as we talk about this, if I can just throw this in, I realize there are probably some listeners out there that we talk about witchcraft and Satanism and so forth. They say, oh, come on. <laughs> but, you know, as, as we think about um, what these prophecies have done in the past, they become a guide as to how we should interpret them right now. 
Do you realize that Daniel in chapter 8, as he was talking about the succession of these great world empires, one after the other, 200 and some years before the birth of Alexander the Great, he predicted in precise detail how he would come like a meteor out of nowhere, and he would conquer all that was before him. And then he, at the, at the apex of his power, would die prematurely as a young man, and out of his place would come four empires. This is exactly what happened. What happened? Because his four generals, Lysimachus, Cassander, T uh, Seleucus, and Ptolemy, took over his empire and divided it into four. It's said, uh, extra-biblically, that the high priest of uh, Israel, when Alexander the Great marched on Jerusalem, came out and with a scroll of Daniel 8 told him that his God had predicted his future and it said that, that he spared Jerusalem because of that and actually took Jews as his governors because he said the gods are with them. Talking about uh, Daniel's accuracy in telling these things, the Bible critics then mm -hmm. uh, place the writing of Daniel later on saying that uh, some man after the fact wrote these things because it would be impossible to write of them with such accuracy as Daniel did before the fact, mm -hmm. which is a presumption that God is not the author of the book, uh, but that the book is uh, authored by man. But the supposed scholars that are uh, gathering now to determine which of the <laughs> sayings uh, are uh, genuinely those of uh, Jesus Christ. The and funk squad. Yes, <laughs> and I thought that that would make it very interesting. We uh, should do that. Yes, really I think should. we really should take on these fellows but, because... But for our listeners, there's yeah. two points we might just footnote here. Mm. That Daniel was in black and white three centuries before Christ was born because it was part of the Jewish canon mm. that was translated into Greek. Mm. And yet it predicts the very day that Jesus Christ presented himself. There's no way that can be late dated. Yeah, Daniel chapter 9 cannot be late dated. Exactly. Because it falls across too many centuries. And the second point is when four disciples come to Jesus privately for a, secret, for a privileged briefing, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ authenticates Daniel. The key to that whole presentation is verse 15 of Matthew 24 mm -hmm. when the word spoken by Daniel the prophet. Coming back to the main point is this, uh, that since the Bible was so accurate in the past, and that can be to any uh, intellectually honest person, yes. it can be demonstrated. When we talk about things like uh, a man that's going to be indwelt by Satan, who will appear to be a wonderful person, who will be truly a great leader, just an evil leader that people will not recognize as such, that we're saying these things based on the fact that the Bible predicts it and it has always predicted these things precisely with 100% with accuracy. And that's what is yes. really apparently yes. taking yes. place in Europe right now, that uh, it's being prepared for this need and that will be filled by this great leader. All right, carrying it just a step further yes. from that. The thing that always excites me is that there is a kingdom that is coming mm. that is going to replace all of these previous kingdoms. It strikes the stone, strikes the great image in its feet so that the whole image crumbles and the stone grows into a mountain that covers the whole earth. But to me, the exciting thing is that Daniel tells us that in the days in which those ten kings are reigning, this stone is going to come. Which means that if indeed what we see happening in Europe today does constitute the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's dream or the ten horns of Daniel's vision, if this is that power that is going to come out of the Roman Empire that is going to have, have this world-dominating world stature, that we are getting very, very, very close to that glorious time that we have been talking about who believe in Bible prophecy, when Jesus Christ will actually come again and establish 
God's kingdom upon this earth. Now, now Jesus told us, told his disciples, which we are, he told us that when we pray, we should be praying, thy kingdom come, and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And I think that uh, the most exciting thing to me about this whole scene of the development and actually setting dates now, and, and they have their agenda. They, they say by uh, the 1st of January, 1993, walls will be down. All of the economic tariffs and all removed. No more border guards, no more border checks within the one common passport, European passport, gets you anywhere within the European community. Even the joining of England with this tunnel uh, with France and, and the whole thing coming together. It's symbolic. Symbolic. And then they're talking about uh, by the end of this uh, century, uh, the uh, common currency. But uh, there is, from a biblical standpoint, a sort of a removing of currency, isn't there? Yes, there is. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's exciting. You, you said that they're now setting dates. Isn't it great? They're setting the dates. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you want to clarify that. Yeah. We've always been accused. Yeah, right. All three of us have been accused but of setting I, dates. But I do believe that since they are setting dates, it, it, my own personal faith is that we're very, very near the time when Christ is going to come for us. And the interesting thing is, and you've all taught me so well, that it isn't one thread. It isn't Europe. It's all of them together. Europe is coalescing. The city of Babylon is being rebuilt. The Soviets are arming the Arab world for an invasion. And while all this is going on, there are plans in Israel to rebuild a temple. If you take about half a dozen major themes of prophecy, they're all converging, converging, converging. on today. Yes. Yeah, that's that, and that's the unique thing in history. I mean, there may have been one or two things in history past at a time that looked like it fit that prophetic scenario that would come together before Christ returns. But it, this is the first time in history it's all been there, yes. and it's all yes. coming together simultaneously. Yes. So what does that mean we should do? Mm. What does the listener say, gee, that's exciting. What's our response to that? Peter actually said, how shall we then live? Mm. And seeing these things, the material world is going to be Dissolve. What manner of men ought we to be? And he surely pointed out that we should be putting our emphasis and our values in the things of the Spirit rather than the material world. And it is so wonderful to realize that God's Word is being fulfilled before our very eyes. And Jesus said two things in the light of his return when his disciples said, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming, the end of the age? Basically, he said, watch, because you don't know the day or the hour. Now, Paul tells us we do know the times and seasons. We're not ignorant of them. But of that day and hour, no man knows. And none of us are going to be so foolish or presumptuous to say that we know the day or the hour. But uh, I do believe that uh, from a biblical standpoint, as Paul said, we are not ignorant of the times, and we shouldn't be. Jesus said, watch, and then the second thing he said is, be ready. And he gave parables that would uh, tend towards being watchful and being ready. So the question is, are you ready? Should the Lord come back for his church? Are you ready? And that should be what should be really the paramount primary concern of your heart today. Am I ready to stand before my Lord? For more information, please write The World Today, P.O. Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628. That's The World Today, Post Office Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628.
Thanks for joining us on The World Today as we take a look at current world issues from a Christian perspective. Our host is Pastor Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa, and our special guests today are noted author and speaker Hal Lindsey and defense specialist Chuck Missler. The eyes of the world are upon Europe and the changes that are taking place in Europe. The Berlin Wall coming down, the opening of Eastern Europe, and we are wondering just what does all of this mean? And is there any relevance between what is happening in Eastern Europe and Russia with the Word of God? Does the Bible give us any insight as far as Russia is concerned? And those are the things that we want to discuss today. The place of Russia in biblical prophecy, covering, of course, the European community and Eastern Europe also. And again, it's a joy to have Chuck Missler and Hal Lindsay as we discuss together uh, the issues that are of primary concern to every one of us because they involve our world today and our world tomorrow. But from a military standpoint, it would seem to me that one of the dominating powers in the world today, from a military standpoint, is Russia, and is something to be reckoned with. I, I know, know that, that a few years, years ago, ago uh, many, many of our generals were pretty pessimistic about our ability to defend uh, Europe. But on the 
they give up Eastern Europe if in exchange they can rebuild themselves, disarm us, and then go for the heart, which is to attack. If they wipe out the United States, they can take all of that back unopposed. In other words, that's a good chess player. It's not a gamble. Exactly. Or a second kind of a scenario is giving up your uh, debits in order to get a credit. In other words, the they European were, were states debit. were in debit. They were having to give them their oil and, and uh, give them uh, what they, you know, the, the, their power sources and all. And uh, look how much money they are, were spending in Cuba to keep Castro going, to Nicaragua to keep that government going. I mean, they were all debits. But what would be the greatest credit that they could pick up? Wow. Would be the Middle East. That's right. And the least amount of risk, and yet would bring them the greatest amount of credit. You know, right. You know, back in uh, about almost 200 years ago now, Bishop Loth and also Bishop Chamberlain wrote, as they studied Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, they said that the, that Russia has a momentous place in future history, as they invade the Middle East. All agree. In other words, they're saying all of the conservative scholars agree that Russia would have a momentous place. And that was over 200 years ago. And they Well, that goes for the control. Anyone who controls the Persian Gulf controls the future. They control the 21st century. And it's interesting to see that Saddam Hussein dungeon and Zalatman jump before it's over the great vacuum. It's also interesting that they tried mm -hmm. to maneuver to be the peacemakers in the right. Persian Gulf. And it's going to be interesting as, as all the little proposals start, every jockey's for, quote, a lasting peace in the Persian Gulf. The wild card mm -hmm. is the Magog and his mates. I don't know whether you got this or not, but uh, I, the, the old critics really came out of the woodwork uh, when the Berlin Wall fell and Eastern Europe was being taken back. They said, yeah, you, you guys with all this prophecy, you talk about Russia playing this major role in the future. Look at it now. They're not going to be in that position. I got a lot of that. But, you know, now we see them fitting right back into that scenario the Bible predicted as part of an overall uh, plan would come together before the return of Christ. I believe that they are still a maverick power with enormous world-threatening ability. And most dictators through history attempt to solve their internal problems by creating an external crisis. Exactly. And by having a common enemy. You know, uniting against a common enemy. The Arabs. Whenever they want to unite the Arabs, we're going to get Israel. Even though we're going to destroy Israel. It's like a charm. Well, that's, yes. another, that, that's another dimension that nobody mentions. But as we talk about the Soviet Union, and where is it the slippery rock that Gorbachev is on? Because he does have some interesting problems today. But let's not lose sight that 30% of his population base is Islamic. Mm. Despite all the lip service, there's no way that Gorbachev can survive being pro-West, except through us as a sovereign. Because he has to deal with the fact that the southern portion of his population is like 110 ethnic minorities, and 30% of them approximately, 100 million people, bow to Islam. And the only thing that unites, we speak of the Arab world, that's a fiction, because there is no thing that unites that so-called world, is only one thing, the hatred of Israel, the unswerving commitment to Islam. Uh, the, the place of uh, uh, roughly a North African Middle Eastern population united by Islam will play. The fact that they will launch another all-out attack against Israel, the fact that they will be joined by the Soviet Union is, is something not only the Bible predicts, but one of the most prestigious uh, monthlies that I, I know of, the Intelligence Digest out of England. It's strictly a secular organ. They have predicted some six times now that before the end of this decade, there will be a nuclear-armed, all-out Arab assault on Israel joined by the Soviet Union. Now, 
Now, this is the keenest uh, reporting group that I know in the world. And next, they're predicting next to Countdown Magazine. Yeah, well, of course, Countdown <laughs> Magazine. But a few years ago in the Reader's Digest, the then general in charge of the NATO forces was being asked about the future of Europe and Russia and all. And he said that he did not think that the conflict would start in Europe. But he felt it would probably start with Russia going into the Middle East and then would boil over into Europe. But he didn't see uh, Europe as the as the trigger point for the future conflict between these major powers. And I thought that that was very yeah. interesting from a biblical standpoint. But why don't we take a look at what uh, our prophet Ezekiel had to say about uh, Gog and Magog. You talk about the Christian fathers 200 years ago uh, putting this identity there. Uh, coming a little bit closer to our time, uh, in fact, I took some courses from Harry Rimmer when he was teaching at Biola, Biola College. Wow. But the shadow of coming events. I always wanted to meet him. And in that book, yeah. uh, he actually gives quite a few interesting uh, predictions that you read it now and you think, my, this fellow wrote yeah. almost 50 years ago, The Shadow of Coming Events, and he was actually just so on target because he stayed with the scripture. You know, if we can just stay with the yeah. scriptures, fellas, yeah. we'll be on target. Yeah. It's where we yeah. get, away, yeah. get around. You know, it, it, he wrote a, uh, Dr. Rimmer wrote a book in 1940 called The Coming War with, with Russia. Russia. Yes, I've read that book. And in that book, it was fascinating. Everyone at that time, I mean, almost every student of Bible prophecy, were saying that Adolf Hitler is the Antichrist, Mussolini's the false prophet, and they were saying that Christ's coming was, was uh, imminent. And Dr. Rimmer, in 1940, came out with that book, and he said, gentlemen, this cannot be the time, because there's one key prophecy that's not in place. Israel is not a nation. Right. And I thought, that's hanging in there yes. with the scripture and yes. sticking with it. Yes. Which brings up an interesting thing, Hal, because whenever you talk about the coming of Jesus Christ again, you always have those people who say, well, you know, haven't they been saying this for a long time? Didn't they believe that he was coming in 1859 and go out and wait on the hillside? And in reality, uh, they believed it in the scriptures. Uh, some in Thessalonians uh, were expecting, uh, in Thessalonica, they were expecting the Lord to return in any time, and their friends that had died, they were grieving because they'd missed out on the kingdom because they died in the, before the Lord has come. And so Paul was writing to them to comfort them about those that were asleep in Christ that they would participate also. Uh, but uh, I do believe that it was the intention, deliberate intention of God, that the church lived from the beginning and in every age with a expectancy, right. air of expectancy. Uh, and it was to be a purifying effect in the church. Uh, he that had this hope in him purifies himself. Certainly no one lost out because, because he, looked, I mean, say 300 years ago, if he looked for Christ to come in his time, he didn't lose out. He was obeying the scripture. You bet. And, you're, and you, it gives an urgency to our work of getting the gospel out and, and serving the Lord. You know, uh, the interesting thing to me, and I've been asked, well, you know, you guys have all been saying these things for, for uh, at least 100 years. Christ hasn't come. What makes this time unique? You know, as I look at that, first of all, in this very passage, Ezekiel chapters 36 through 39, Got it. Uh, it, it speaks of the restoration of the land and, of, and of bringing the people back. And from the restoration of Israel after a worldwide dispersion, it indicates they will never be destroyed as a nation and scattered again. So the time they predicted is when Israel is reborn as a nation in the last days, they will go through great difficulty, great suffering, but they will never be destroyed again. And it's as though there's a countdown from the birth of Israel 
right up until the final events and the return of Christ. Even uh, predicting in chapter 36, the land, the mountains of Israel, the trees being replanted, the, the valleys being filled with grain and so forth. How have we seen that? Well, the interesting thing is that that was to precede the nation. Exactly. And so the Zionist movement that went in and started reclaiming the land, planting those orchards in the Sharon Valley and Please write The World Today, P.O. Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628. That's The World Today, Post Office Box 8000, Costa Mesa, California, 92628.